It is my pleasure to introduce the Sensors and Edge Computing Panel moderator, Brent. The stage is now yours. Okay, thank you everyone, and uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to Andreas and Texas State University and Cedar. So I'm actually graduated from Texas State University, and uh, it's great to see this event. I think next year will be the fifth year. Imagine what this event is going to be in another five years. Um, this is truly world class, all the content here. So today we have a panel here to talk about sensors and edge compute. <coughs> And um, I prefer to sit down here, so I'm going to take a seat and let the panelists uh, answer, and I, I might stand up at some point. But I'd like to sit down with the panelists like we did yesterday. <clears throat> so um, first, I'd like everybody on the panel to introduce themselves and explain what your company does and um, who you sell to. Can we start with Scott? Sure, uh, I'm Scott Henson, I'm the CTO of Pecan Street. Um, we are a 501c3, so we don't do a lot of selling. Uh, we do have um, uh, data licenses and access to the data that we collect. Uh, uh, the reason that uh, I'm up here on this panel is because we have all sorts of uh, sensors and IoT devices in folks' homes. Uh, we have uh, roughly, uh, over the course of our entire program, uh, about a thousand volunteer participants, and at this point we are collecting about 8.3 billion data points a day uh, on how people are using and producing energy, uh, using uh, water, using natural gas, uh, and transportation. We're also starting to get into soil uh, research, soils research, um, because there is a lack of critically needed data there um, uh, and, and critically needed information for, for carbon sequestration purposes. Uh, so that is what we do. Uh, we then take that data and we turn it over at very low cost or free to uh, university researchers worldwide. Uh, over the years we've had something on the order of 3,000 university researchers access and use the data. Um, uh, we, at any given moment we have about uh, 800 uh, active accounts with 40 to 60 researchers worldwide uh, actively querying the data. Thank you, Richard. Good morning, my name is Richard Scrindy. My company is Grid Pathway, and we've been involved in building a national team of leading grid modernization researchers that belong to our university system or our major research institutes. And our goal is to figure out the business model that's going to break the grid gridlock where, as we all know, until the pain of maintaining the status quo is so much greater than the pain of the corrective change, nothing can happen. And we are out to advocate ways to support the work that Michael and Intel is doing by finding incremental pathways to start to move towards getting control of our grid edge of course, the acceleration of the recent federal initiatives that's going to bring us an extra $300 billion of DER sooner or later has moved that pain point to now I think we can all come together and find a way to raise the monies out of the federal government to support all of our industry and academic research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary? Yes, my name is uh, Gary Ayer. I'm from Sentient Energy. I'm the Vice President of Business Development. What Sentient Energy does is we live on the distribution circuits, both overhead and underground circuits, and our business is grid reliability. So just to give you a financial view, um, using our technology, which is sensors, software, and analytics, our utility customers have saved over 100 million customer minutes interrupted, and the value in the United States for a minute is about a dollar ten. most people would say. So our solutions are being used actively for grid reliability, grid resilience, and, and increasingly now with all these renewables coming on the grid, grid flexibility. Thank you. Uh, Sarmia? Hi, I'm Samia Osborne. I am a product manager for the Internet of Things and Automotive Department in ARM. 
Um, some of you may not be aware of us, but we are one of those best kept secrets in the world. We design and license microchips. So along with our partners, we shipped collectively 29.2 billion chips in fiscal year 2022. So all the great initiatives that, that my final panelists are, are here doing, our technology helps enable a, a lot of that. And we often say that if it's not a car, it's not a, smart, it's not a smartphone, and uh, it's not a server, it's probably in the IoT and embedded space. And how many chips did you say shipped? That was 29.2 billion in fiscal year 2021, our partners shipped. Wow, incredible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric? Uh, thank you. My name is Eric Frazier. I am the CEO of Tensor Networks. And uh, from a sustainability background, uh, I went to graduate school at Harvard University for sustainability and environmental management. And I live in California, uh, but I'll be the last person to virtue signal in terms of green uh, I think we're all here to make money, and what we see from a Tensor Networks perspective is there is a paradigm shift in connectivity and communications from Web 2.0 to Web 3. It's happening. It's happening very fast. Most of us hear cloud, cloud applications, client server type applications all the time, but just in the last presentation, what's becoming very mainstream is you heard Bitcoin. Bitcoin is Web 3 technology. And so we build a platform at Tensor Networks that enables system integrators, partners, and enterprises to build applications in a Web3 format or blockchain. Blockchain is the only secure and private method to secure infrastructure and communications and to build out reliable connectivity for IoT and sensors. So Eric, building on what you're saying, can you describe a little bit more about your product or services? Yeah, so we, make, uh, so we make a platform called Matrix OS. Matrix OS will run on ARM devices or what we refer to x86, Intel slash AMD. Um, and it's a comprehensive turnkey solution that installs in about five minutes. Uh, we've got a good video of that on our website. But creates a virtualized environment. So when we move away from client server, there is no man in the middle or what's referred to in Web 2.0 as the clearinghouse. And that's exactly what it is. I can't communicate with you and you can't communicate with me unless Microsoft Teams or whatever the middleman says is okay. But in a peer-to-peer -peer networking world, we talk to each other f freely, right? So, but everything is through a secure blockchain and on a distributed ledger. So this is a paradigm shift and there's a learning curve, but again, you hear it in terms of fintech, uh, you hear it in terms of Ethereum or Bitcoin, but these things are happening and they're happening very fast. Um, it doesn't make sense for intelligent infrastructure to speak to a connected vehicle through a cloud service. They need to be able to speak directly. It's much lower latency and it's much more secure. Okay, thank you. And uh, Sarmi, uh, the, of all the billions of chips you're shipping, um, do you know specific market act, market segments that you're selling into that will be considered um, edge solutions? And are you manufacturing or you still have the licensing of the ARM architecture model? So we're still working on a licensing model so we don't actually manufacture ourselves. What we do is we license our designs to our partners and then there is a licensing fee and a royalty model associated to that. And of all of those ships, our chips shipped last year, we say about two thirds of those are in this um, IoT and, and embedded space. So with the work that has been described here by some of our panel members, um, the importance of more intelligent ship, chips at the edge and having increased capability, low power and intelligence is growing more and more important, especially as we've heard today is we've got these different challenges around climate change and ensuring having the correct data and insights to help tackle some of these problems. So you said about two thirds of those chips were into IoT type solutions? Correct. And how, how big is the team in Austin these days? Uh, our Austin team is one of our core design centers, actually. Um, so we have about 1,000 people working uh, predominantly in our CPU space. We're actually designing the microchips and, and the designs, too. But we also have quite a big support team here helping our partners actually onboard and use and get to market with their technology, as well as some of our sales colleagues are here based in Austin, too. OK. All right. Thank you. And. Uh, Gary, you mentioned underground and overhead. Mm -hmm. um, 
so you've got some sensing and some data analytics. Yes. Could you explain more about the, the products um, yeah, or absolutely. services? Yeah, absolutely. So when you, when you are in the reliability business, fundamentally you're looking for large sustained outages. Typically utilities, electric utilities are focused on over five minutes. Uh, if you will, yeah. to call, and, and whether it's overhead or underground, I think the opportunity then becomes for you to kind of minimize those because it in, inconvenience a lot of residential commercial and industrial customers that they serve. But then you start getting much more fine-grained with momentaries or transient events that take place. And then we also have a capability for doing some pre-fault analysis uh, because of the extremely high fidelity of our technology. Okay. Where are you, um, where are you having the most adoption? Is it uh, Texas-based, U.S.-based, or global? Uh, yeah, so we've been around for over a decade now, and we're okay. continuing to, you know, improve on our R&D to make our technology more contemporary. So we have proven customers like Florida Power and Light, uh, Alabama Power, and we are deploying with multiple other utilities, uh, Exelon, uh, you know, Dominion, LADWP. Uh, clearly, with uh, some of the investments that are now coming into the industry, our, our, and with our recent acquisition uh, two years ago into Coke engineer solutions, our aspirations are very much global. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so Richard, I know you're, you've got a, a broad background, uh, inventor, solution provider, uh, solution seeker. Could maybe you explain a little bit more about what your current focus is? You said a little bit about it in the intro, but maybe we could dive into that a little bit more. Yes, I, Everybody ends up being a seeker when you live in a regulated utility environment where you've got to make a rate case and it's impossibly difficult to get the momentum we need to catch up to the rate of change. And I've been looking for out-of-the-box solutions to find accelerators and I've built relationships with UT and TXT and EPRI and SWERI and you name it, you find places where you have thought leadership and what's missing is like when you go to the Olympics they have the dream team where they get the best of every organization and resource it to go make a win for the nation and we've not been able to do that in our world because the federal government has such a big footprint in supplying the money to everybody and they're forcing competition through their FOAs and everybody's fighting for the same dollar. So I've come up with a new model where I've built a 10-year relationship with the IBEW who builds the grid, supports the grid, and they're threatened because they need to find a next generation of youngsters to join their organization and kids want to do digital. You can't find a kid right. that wants to ride around in a bucket truck with side cutters anymore. So they actually did the lobby work in the recent bipartisan infrastructure law that secured $60 billion for grid modernization. And as a fellow of the IBEW, I've been tasked to form an industry-backed solution that they will take to the White House and ask for an executive order to get us funded, which is like a really extraordinary move for them. But, you know, they are partnered up to the hip with Intel. They're building the new chip factories. They built the Gigafactory. They've got this fabulous workforce, and they don't have the connection to get the parts and pieces into the supply chain to put this to work, and that's my mission currently. Where are you located right now? Uh, I, I'm located in Fort Lauderdale because it's halfway between Texas and Washington, D.C. Okay. <laughs> and I am a supporter. I'm an ambassador of Andres' startup effort to build out that fabulous lab. And my goal is to get the resourcing that lives within the DOE and their distributed control theory work of a decade the resourcing that lives within EPRI, who has launched their unified grid control platform and done all the study work on Michael's, Michael Bates, we all need to owe him a huge debt of gratitude. He's stuck his neck out and has created something that is just beyond belief. We saw here to go from a 1960 car that everything is manual to a 2020 
automated vehicle where everything is automatic. And my goal is to incrementally find a way where he's working with the largest utilities, the top brains, but we have 2,000 munis, and we saw some of those people here. And they don't have those kind of resources. And underneath them, there's 2,000 co-ops. They got, you know, 200 people. And the field people, their revolutionary device to save their life is the automated disconnect switch. And to be able to turn our grid into a plug-and-play PC so people at all the levels can transparently plug in what they need and the magic of automation makes it smooth is really like the miracle of our time. And Llewellyn King said this morning in the State of the Union that it's a life or death situation that we get this electricity right. So is, I'm curious to know the, the Michael Bates or the Intel solution, is this a way to have more instantaneous remote monitoring and control yeah, um, of grid systems? I spent my background working as an invited entrepreneurial architect for EPRI in their advanced generation program, looking at extending the life of these big plants until we could get the renewables to catch up. And the Obama administration made the argument, we got to get rid of them now. So these are all being shelved, but the thought that you could move generation from the center to the edge without moving the control programs from generation to the edge at the same time or before is completely ludicrous. And the issues that you face at the edge, a hundred years they figured out how to step down transmission voltage so it's at the right voltage when it goes into the building. Well, stepping up this voltage that comes from DC and manipulating your way through all of the volt <coughs> bar all the reactive power, all of the phasing, all these control issues that they've done in central generation forever is like a monstrous challenge. Okay. We'll get back to that. I think there's more to build on there. Scott, um, so I've followed your work and the work at Pecan Street for a long time. I know in the early days you were monitoring a lot of uh, uh, power at home, uh -huh. how that was being used, how appliances affected that. How has that model grown, and have you been able to share it like with California? Right now, California's going through this heat wave. I know a lot of your work was with San Diego. Have you been able to proliferate that throughout the state? So, um, yes, uh, and, and unfortunately, no. Um, so, w w when we put our monitoring systems in, in homes, um, at this point, we are collecting one second interval data on every single circuit in the home. So that means we understand which devices are flexible, which devices are not, the behavior that drives those devices, because when you, when you, when you see the actual timing of, of and, and we, can, we can literally watch this, not, not, not sound creepy about it at all, but we can, we can, we can see the, um, you know, if it's a, a lightly loaded garage circuit, we can see the garage door open. And then we just watch the various rooms come on, and then we can see appliances start to get used. So we know, okay, well, when this person came home, they immediately started cooking dinner. Or when this person came home, they didn't, right? And all sorts of behavioral changes and things like that. And what we have been trying to do is, is sort of get the word out that electric vehicles, and, and um, Mr. Bates touched on this um, uh, uh, in his presentation, while they represent a challenge, um, they actually also represent one of the most flexible loads ever in a residential property. Not a new load, they're clearly the most flexible new load in a residential property, but they are the most flexible load. Um, something on the order of 70% of our residential charging events are less than 10 kilowatt hours. And at a three or four, um, actually it might be 90% or less than 10 kilowatt hours. Um, and, and at a three or four kil kilowatt charge rate or a 10 kilowatt charge rate, that tells you that, that you know, you're somewhere between one and three hours of charging per day uh, for the vast majority of charge events. And that car is sitting there plugged in for hours and hours and hours at a time. And so that tells us that, uh, you know, the, the other thing that, that we've looked at is charge um, profiles, right? So 
uh, the big fear for years has been everybody comes home, plugs in at the same time. I can tell you that doesn't happen. Um, what we see is a vastly more varied charging uh, behavior than, than what most people expect. What I can tell you happens is that nobody is charging at 8 a.m., right? Everybody comes in, charges at different times, but what they want is that vehicle to be ready at a certain time, and that is to go to work. And so you have this gigantic window in which you can charge that vehicle. Um, and so, so we've done a number of papers on this. We've looked at sort of the, the power quality metrics that you just talked about. We've looked at panel sizing for total electrification. We've looked at uh, advanced charge rates, and all those papers are free to download off our website. I can um, just go there, and there's a, there's a research paper uh, link up there. Um, there is no charge, and that's how we're getting the word out. We know that there is PUC commissioners, because you have to put your email address in <laughs> from a lot of states <laughs> downloading those. Uh, so we know it is getting out, but what we don't understand yet is quite yet is the impact. So I want to build on what you're talking about there. It, it sounds like the early days of collecting all this information, you were using a lot of sensors. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the sensor types and have you been able to um, modify consumer behavior, and if so, how do they realize the reward? Yes, um, so, so we, we have installed a ton of sensors and, and we're constantly identifying new data gaps. I mentioned this uh, on, a, on a panel yesterday where like um, uh, health researchers don't have uh, good indoor, indoor air quality data, and when I say good, they, don't, they really don't have any, right? So we've actually got a sensor package for that that we've developed. We've developed sensor packages to monitor water, we've, uh, natural gas. To, to monitor uh, physical uh, constant or physical parameters of air conditioning units. We have a ton of different sensors. We are now moving into activation and, and actions based on that information, right? We're doing a, um, uh, a trial, uh, a program, a research program with University of Michigan funded by RPE where we are taking thermostatic loads, um, air conditioners, uh, and we're actually following reg up, reg down signals from um, uh, the, the ISOs. Um, and we're able to, with those slow loads, if you have enough of them, you can actually follow a very fast um, uh, moving control signal. Now, that's all predicated on making a very good prediction of what action is about to happen in that house. Uh, but, but the University of Michigan folks have, have basically cracked that nut. And so um, we are, we are, desperately uh, trying to get these solutions and these, um, uh, this information out uh, into the public domain um, and, and, and so, so pe folks can be using it. Just one more question. Um, how no, do we get no involved in what you're no. doing? How do we get involved <laughs> um, in what you're doing? Can, are those sensor sets available um, So um, we are always looking for uh, research grants. We would have thought that the air quality sensor um, would have been a pretty easy fund, uh, but we went to NSF and they said no. Uh, we went to the EPA, um, and I think we're still waiting to hear back on that one. Um, uh, but we would love to get, uh, we're always looking for um, uh, uh, foundation research grants, either from uh, the, the charitable arm of, of large corporate entities, uh, private foundations, or, or frankly, even cooperative research projects with um, uh, commercial entities, as long as there is some sort of public benefit uh, portion of that research program, the corporate entity can, can learn their secret sauce and go away, and we have the public benefit, and that, that keeps the, the, the nonprofit mission and status um, happy. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to switch over to the other side of the table here. Um, so, Gary, your, your solutions are considered, your sensing solutions and the data analytics, you would consider that at the edge, is that correct? Very much so. It, it lives between the substation and the meter at the end. Okay. Right? And I think the evolution we are seeing is really from a predominant focus on reliability. Okay. Which was, which was the more traditional way to look at the grid to one which is more resilient now. And that okay. is very relevant in these days of hurricanes and wildfires and storms and floods and what have you. And yeah. then the flexibility piece, like uh, Scott talked about, 
is very contemporary as well now, right? So we'll, no matter where somebody locks into their home or their office or their building, the feeders and the laterals see those things, right? So we live on those circuits between the substation and the meter, and we're dynamically monitoring okay. at the highest resolution in the industry. Are you running into challenges that keep you from selling more or growing uh, at the rate you would like to grow? Yeah, so I think uh, the funding is no more an issue for our customers. They have plenty of funds out there. I think they, the funding is also there for a rollout of 4G, 5G class communications. I believe that is one of the limitations we have because there are dark spots, blind spots, and poor coverage areas all over the United States, leave alone the world. And the third part of it, I think all of us on this you know, stage will tell you, is change management. You're looking yeah. at the you know, digitalization of everything. I'm talking about digitalization of the feeders, right? So that, that takes some time. That takes folks getting comfortable with it and making sure they understand that there is a better way to do it than roll a truck to go see something. Okay. So these are B2B solutions. And um, what do you do to accelerate the adoption or, or the customer pull through? Look, it, nothing convinces better than a case study. So I'll give you the case study of Alabama Power, right? About the, the, the power of what was done there, con, you know, and it was very convergent with their existing technology paradigm. They deployed us on about, I'm gonna say 1,800, 1,900 feeders. And in a matter of three to four years, they saved over 40 million minutes, CMI minutes, at, 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 a, at a dollar seven, right? So when they are able to stand there as a customer of ours, and say we deployed and we are, we are able to reap a return on an investment of 42 million, which is perceived as a benefit by the end rate payer. That, mm -hmm. that is the best marketing weapon we have is customer testimonials. Okay. Um, Sarmia, are you running into any challenges on adoption? I know Arm is a, it's a big company, lots of IP, and the architecture is famous, but are you running into any challenges in the past Three years. I think what we're coming up against is seeing that, you know, even here on the panel today, there's various use cases for our technology. So it's defragmentation of software is really a challenge that we are investing a lot of engineering effort into, making sure that when <coughs> workloads and information is, is being exchanged between all of these different sensors and use cases, that there's a common language, there's a common set of security standards, there's a common set of software that end, that end users um, can, can develop on is, is really the challenge that, that we're seeing. And you know, as some people have already raised here, it's, it's easy to raise demand when you're going directly to the consumer, but when you're in a B2B model, sometimes that change management and that willingness to change is, can be variant, but because we deal with people who are engaging all across the ecosystem, we're seeing varying levels depending on what industry that we're in. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Eric, um, so I kind of want to focus on the edge here. How important is it that this edge be um, independent or private? And is there something considered public edge? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, edge, I, I would, our CTO calls edge a marketing term. Um, so there's, there's a way to look at it in terms of what he would say is data gravity. So what you want to do is move compute closer to the data. That reduces the amount of latency uh, and allows for machine-to-machine uh, -machine enablement for critical decision making, right? So in, in the sense of a grid, if you're having a grid scenario or a situation, um, a machine-to-machine -machine environment should be able to react to that in a much lower latency scenario than a machine-to-human scenario or a machine to a an operation center where it's got to roll up uh, a, a level, a chain of authority before a decision can be made. Our company started out um, really looking at this challenge from a smart city or connected community perspective. Uh, and we started our business in 2019 and then we ran into COVID and so funding was, was not the norm. In fact, uh, most of the VCs uh, were looking for later stage companies. But we found the DOD, and the DOD had some very interesting programs for startups, especially startups that were focused on artificial intelligence like we are. Um, so we, we wound up at military bases, which are, in an essence, a small city. 
they have their own emergency services, police, fire, etc., cetera, um, um, and are able to be uh, operated independently, right, as you can imagine, and they have to be dispersed and not centralized. So um, the federal government talks about cloud, but they're really, really big on this Web3. In fact, there's a company in Atlanta that was in a small business that was just awarded a $13.4 billion contract to do non-fungible tokens with the federal government. So um, that company is called Eminent Domain. It's a very interesting story. So there's a lot happening in terms of, back to the question, whether it's private or public. I think public edge is just, you know, akin to the telephone companies when they used to lease you your telephone. It was their phone, you got to use it, and you used it through their network. That was not an independent scenario, um, though it may, may have felt independent. Um, true edge is independent and peer-to-peer -peer and survivable in scenarios of disruption or disaster. And then all of the downstream sensors from that device are also survivable. Yeah, may I add a comment to that, if you don't please, mind? Please, please do. So I, I did want to build on that notion of edge that, that you mentioned there. Um, so one definition of edge is, if you will, behind the meter, where in the industry perhaps there has not been enough focus on who the residential buyer is or the commercial industrial buyer is. I think another definition of edge is how difficult is it for, you, for a particular utility to send the crews over there? Is it rural? Is it hard to reach in a hilly area or you know, you know, difficult terrain? So both these edges matter, and the situational awareness that I think you particularly heard from Scott on a dynamic basis of what are people doing at the edge? So for me, edge is actually a time to value offering, which is if you are at the truly at the edge, any solution that is being deployed, there must be a fast time to value solution because we don't have time for these multi-year, multi-phased rollouts. What is the quickest solution you can deploy? Yeah, now, I'll add to that. I, I concur, and I think in the, in the case of uh, where I live in California, wildfires are a challenge, especially this time of year, and uh, oftentimes it's uh, uh, vegetation, coming into contact with infrastructure. Now, if you could see that in real time and be proactive about it, that that vegetation is getting close to that infrastructure, the wind uh, from a forecast is going to pick up, you can do something about it. Um, after the fact, you can just go back and think about what happened and try to improve it from the future perspective. But we're talking about low latency, situational awareness for real time decision making. Absolutely. So Eric, I want to make sure we understand your product. You're converging uh, data and data science and cloud and accelerated computing into a hardware box that can be deployed. Is it enterprise or premises or home-based solutions? Yeah, yeah, really. I mean, you can. There's a great video. It's kind of it's kind of funny and it's kind of cynical. But uh, Larry Ellison, who talks about cloud, if you YouTube it, and he's like, you know, it's not water vapor. Right, it's <laughs> it's processors and hard drives and memory and servers. It's just somebody else's. So what we do is we essentially take that, put it out to the edge. Okay, so let's call it a server at the edge. But then there is all of the things that the cloud does in terms of virtualizing all of that capacity within that device. So when you use a cloud service, you usually pay by the processor core. Processors typically have dozens of cores now. So they sell by the core for your service or your application, and they virtualize that up. We do the same thing on the edge. So there can be multiple use cases, multiple workloads that are separated from each other. And then the connectivity between the devices, now we believe in this Web3 um, uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, which is a new set of protocols and a new way to go about things. But it, actually, it's very proven at this point. Uh, and it's absolutely the future. So hope that addresses the yeah, question. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so I just kind of want to talk about the sensor a little bit. To me, so I've you know, been working on the sensor side of things since I started my career. And it, when I first started my career at MCC in 1995, we were developing sensors. 
and then we integrated those onto chip on board. So now we're putting a sensor closer to a processing unit. And then we evolved that into smaller packages. We call that system in a package. But now the, 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 the phrase now is system on a chip. To me, that's what's driving the ability to do edge compute. But then there's got to be this cloud communication. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit, Scott, about SOCs. Are you having just sensors, or do you have compute with sensor combined together? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we um, uh, as a we are a, a, a tiny little drop of that 29.3 billion processors, but we buy. Uh, uh, ARM processor, system on a chip type things, uh, and deploy them all the time. Um, we, um, it has been a struggle recently uh, getting uh, enough uh, boards and platforms to, 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 to put everything out there that we want to put out there, but um, we are uh, constantly coming up with new ways of using, um, you know, and, and, and we buy because of our quantities, um, we typically buy from the um, sort of hobbyist maker space. So we're buying Arduino and Raspberry Pi and uh, a little board uh, made by somebody, uh, I think from Canada, called Teensy, which is a um, very powerful ARM processor where we did, um, uh, what was the total? It was four channels of synchronous A to D at 16-bit depth, 10 kilohertz sample rate, and then we did a ton of DSP uh, processing on that so that we basically had a little um, uh, micro synchro phaser uh, plus data capture board in uh, panels and we were getting uh, cycle by cycle information and then compressing it and sending that back up to um, our servers so it was a it was a little custom job we did for some folks but we we do that kind of thing all the time and and we have to have uh, I've I've yet to deploy one of these where I say you know what I just had too much processing power. I just did not need <laughs> that much processor. Um, every time I'm running right up against the limits, I mean, it's, it's complete feature creep on my part, right? Because I, I get to go play scientist instead of engineer and just get the job done. I'm like, oh, we could also collect this. Oh, we could also collect this. And then I do. Um, so I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot there. But, but it, it, I've never never once had the problem of just way too much edge processing power. I, I'm constantly needing more. Do you have a model where you're capturing IP and potentially licensing these unique systems? We, we do sort of keep track of those things. We have a mechanism by which we could um, uh, uh, spin off um, a for-profit entity. Um, we looked really hard, as I mentioned yesterday in, a, in the water panel, we looked really hard at doing that with a, a device that we created that uh, and um, we had some provisional patents on it. Whether or not we were first, um, uh, I'm forgetting that there's actually a commercial company that does now and I'm blanking on their name. Um, but uh, what it did was is it retrofitted onto an old um, uh, positive displacement water meter and there's a set of disc magnets in there that meet up north-south and as the water goes through those spin. And we used the compass chipset from a phone, which is very, very low power, and we could watch the, the magnet spin north, south, north, south, north, south. And every time that magnet goes around, that's four ounces of water. So instead of one lid flip once a month, we had four ounce resolution. So we thought about licensing that out. What it turns out, though, is that when we really looked at it at the end of the day, sometimes the, the I mean, it's a great idea. Um, it's super valuable data, but um, we were making a bigger impact and we're sort of <laughs> way too altruistic. We're like, we're just going to keep going with the nonprofit. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, there's a lot of potential there. Thanks for um, being transparent like that. Um, I think there is a model there for Pecan. Uh, Richard, I wanted to ask you directly, what role does edge computing play to you beyond what you've already talked about or in addition to? Distributed control theory, which is the kind of scientific backbone of trying to get decentralized. If you study the literature, decentralization is going to open up millions of new active nodes that all need to be managed or controlled 
and you can't get there the way they've been getting there traditionally by everybody comes up with short win one-off approaches doing it differently and to me the thing that edge computing really offers is a standardized format to move from that mid-tier, in our case the substation, and out to where the meters are, what people call the edge, and to be able to do the controls where, at central control, they were going to want to see, can we solve the problem with the resources at the very edge? which is going to be the inverters, the behind the equipment, and then if there's a problem, we've got to elevate it up another layer and look at the resources in the substation. Can we solve it there? And if we can't, then you've got to go back to the big spin gen plant and say, slammer baby, and just go burn your way through the problem. And so <coughs> edge computing is becoming a framework in the LF Foundation and all of their work. You know, you just have to find a way to take those standardized vehicles and be able to use them because if you don't, everybody's just going to be doing it their way and we're going to have a grid right. that looks like the one we have today. So it sounds it's key to decentralized and distributed power. You have to have a way to get there. Okay. And so we have to make that LF stuff grow up and be able to yeah. handle mission critical, five nines reliability, belt and suspender security, all that stuff the utility industry yeah. does. Okay, um, so I attend these uh, semiconductor executive calls once a month and the past year, the majority of the time taken up in these talking about supply chain challenges. Could any of you want to speak to supply chain challenges and how that's Make has it, it had make an impact it stop. in your business? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be hard pressed to find a company that says okay. that supply chain has not been an issue, but may I build on the point that Richard made? Sure, please. Uh, now, I'm not mentioning this as an impediment for us, but I think for anybody wanting to be talking about pushing compute decisions and monitoring to the edge, one of the, I'm going to call the you know, right to do business in this space is to make sure you weatherproof your system. So, you, you, and it's a very non-trivial idea, yeah. but it's simplistic enough. What, what is sophisticated for us is we have earned the stripes and have the scars on our back to show you that to make sure that these devices, intelligent devices with a lot of computing and analytics and capability to make decisions by themselves are, you know, heat and water and wind and sunlight, et cetera. So to make sure it can be trusted by the utility workers so they don't have to go back to it uh, again. So that one attribute that is needed for us to truly now design a new 21st century grid that Richard wants also needs to have that readiness for these systems to be weatherproof. So weatherproofing, interesting. Um, I think there's maybe some, some synergy to build on on that question that was for Richard. Um, Eric or Sarmi, would you want to comment on how important it is that Edge be, I'm sorry, that the role in which edge computing plays. Would you like to continue with that? Well, I mean, so we can get into a lot of virtues of safety and green and all that stuff, but really I like economics. Uh, some people say, pundits in the industry, the edge is the new cloud, um, but I think it's a distributed or decentralized cloud. There's some fascinating new technologies um, um, around file sharing um, distributed file sharing across anybody that wants to volunteer their excess storage capacity and generate what's called now Filecoin, which is a crypto type currency. Um, that's, that's got a lot of steam behind it and very interesting. So the concept of you've got capacity, whether it's compute or storage or, or processing, um, and you can share that in a decentralized distributed fashion that's essentially the cloud concept that's centralized but distributed. So it's very interesting, allows for everybody to participate. Um, I think the same thing around distributed energy resources uh, is similar. It's an economic opportunity. Bitcoin and Web3 and, and uh, distributed finance is also a financial opportunity. When we develop new financial opportunities for people, they get excited and they get engaged. I'll give everybody one challenge here. 
or I'll ask the audience, has anybody ever heard of a DAO? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, wow, a lot of people have heard of a DAO. I'm actually impressed by that because most of the time when I ask that question, I don't get that much of a response. Could, could you repeat the word? DAO, D-A-O. Okay, all right. It's a decentralized autonomous organization. It's actually a new business entity structure. Uh, you can form your, your entity in Wyoming or Delaware. Uh, but it's completely um, distributed, autonomous, and actually can also be anonymous. And so I think this, whether you call it gig working or the Uber model or uh, this kind of shared infrastructure or, or co-op, um, this is kind of the way of the future. So Web3 certainly supports that. It absolutely is anti-big tech centralized control and control of all the information and data. Our data is very valuable. If you look at the top 10 wealthiest people in the world, they're all in the cloud business because they want that data. So who owns the data when somebody deploys your system? Does the owner of your equipment? You, you own your data. It's, uh, it's super private. Okay. So Web3 is all uh, decentralized blockchain distributed ledger. Okay. So I want to go back to the supply chain, but maybe not the question I ask. Um, is supply chain still a challenge? Are you seeing any improvement? All of us here. Uh, supply chain absolutely is a challenge, especially when it comes to um, accelerated processing like GPUs that we leverage. Um, that was a big challenge for us. But anytime you can, can leverage software to define the processing, um, you have some workaround capability. Sorry, yes, especially for those longer lead industries like the automotive space, we're definitely seeing reports of still supply chain issues and it going as far the, into the next couple of years, maybe even up to half a decade for some people, so it's definitely an issue. And that's one of the reasons why Arm has taken the initiative. We recently launched a product called Arm Virtual Hardware, where we're actually visualizing uh, development boards like the Raspberry Pi that Scott used, for example, enables it in the cloud. So there are some workarounds using software. So while in companies are waiting for hardware, access to hardware, maybe priced out of hardware, there's opportunity to test and develop um, using software components with, with virtual hardware in the cloud. Okay. So I think it, you said two to three year lead time still on components? Yes. Sometimes and, uh, longer depending so on being specialized. you're doing a lot of software development within ARM? Correct. To help bridge a gap right now? Yes, correct. Um, does ARM have any uh, say fabrication capabilities or is it all no we don't we work with yeah. all the fab partners that are actually available as we know that that industry is also consolidating yeah. so we're working yeah. with everyone okay and what about gary how about supply chain improvements i think uh, we were ahead of the process um you know thanks to covid we had to think a little bit ahead of it but we are not exempt from it for sure i think the short term we have under control but like everybody else i think as you start looking one to two years out we are concerned. Okay. Uh, any initiatives to uh, reshore or find U.S. manufacturers or suppliers? I think there are all the incentives in place to kind of think of that. We were made in USA anyway. Okay, good. Um, so that's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, Scott, I know you're a little bit different business model there, but are you being impacted at all by the supply chain? Or absolutely. I yeah. mean, we've had we had. Um, one program that was completely threatened, like we were going to have to say, oh, sorry, we can't do it because we just couldn't find enough uh, um, cheap compute boards to, to do the program. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, our solution was um, apparently bad housekeeping um, because we scoured our facility and lo and behold, we found a box of 40... Uh, raspberry Pis, we needed 25. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was yeah, like, okay. oh, okay. All but right. I mean, like, that's the situation that we're, that we're in as a small nonprofit that can't put two, three, four year orders in, right? Like, I just can't for uh, the, 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 we sort of have to snap them up when we see them, um, uh, you know, and, and sort of claw our way to get um, yeah. uh, available stuff. But when we found the box, it was, there was hooting and hollering, and yeah, we yeah. did. <laughs> well, uh, so in, in the spirit of getting towards the end of our panel here, we've heard a few success stories. Um, could each of you share maybe a different success story, maybe 
uh, something more recent with you, Scott, and and then we'll go down the, the table. Sure. Here. So, um, you know, we are, um, you know, we, we currently collect electricity data um, from Austin, where we got started, um, Northern California, uh, upstate New York, Ithaca, uh, around the Cornell campus. Um, uh, in the last year, we have added Detroit and Puerto Rico. We're seeing fascinating electrical data come out of Puerto Rico, uh, both from a grid stability side and from a uh, consumer behavior side, because it is such uh, different behavior uh, on, on that island uh, than the continuous 48. Um, it was a very eye-opening experience to go there and just literally everywhere you look is a backup generator and or um, uh, UPS uh, supplies for critical equipment. In the coming year, we're going to add four more um, uh, cities and, and areas for, from both climate regions we don't have and socioeconomic uh, um, uh, uh, groups that we don't have. Because, you know, our original three test beds, uh, you know, the, the best way to say it is we sort of know how lawyers and doctors and engineers use data, right? And these are early adopters that signed up with us, and we're making a concerted effort to find um, uh, data across more socioeconomic groups because what we're finding is uh, climate, uh, distributed climate solutions, you know, um, solar, electric vehicles, they're not um, particularly equitable right now, and we're trying to figure out how to solve that. So uh, in, the in the coming year, we're gonna be adding somewhere on the order of another four to six billion data points a day for our poor data group. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, okay. a, that's a success for us. Okay. Um, we've just got time for a couple more answers here. But maybe share a, a recent a success story with us, Eric? Oh, sure. Uh, so last week, we, uh, exciting, um, okay, sure. we got our largest contract to date with, uh, if anybody's ever heard of an organization called SRI, or Stanford Research International. Um, very, very cool organization and had, they do lots of very interesting stuff. Um, and also a very difficult customer because they got lots of smart people. But uh, we were able to solve some problems for them. So, yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, Richard, you, you had something you wanted to share with us here. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a success story. I had the, either the good or the bad fortune, depending on how you look at it, to have known Andre since the 1980s. <laughs> and coincidentally, this date, seven years ago in 2015, in just about an hour, I was having coffee and lunch with Andres, and we were having a conversation about grid gridlock and what we might do about it. And now, seven years forward, I'm a Cedar ambassador for Andres, and we're all sitting here today, and I think that's a fabulous success. That story. is, that is, that really is. Sure. I tell you what, um, so we're actually at the end of our panel session, but I, we have a networking session coming up here, okay. and you might want to share some of your success stories as we network. I know I'd like to hear Sarmia and, and Gary uh, about recent success stories. Uh, but Andreas, thank you very much for having us. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you all for coming, and make sure you're here next year. Absolutely. So come around, take a selfie. What a great job. <laughs>